Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President of the Atlanta Council. Thank you for joining us today for a special Pride event in partnership with our colleagues at Glyfa, the Organization for LGBT Plus Employees, and the State Department and other foreign affairs agencies. I'm delighted that we are joined today by the Deputy Secretary of State, Steve Began, to help mark State, the State Department's own celebration this Pride Month. Each year, the Atlanta Council commemorates Pride by featuring expert analysis and publications and hosting national and global leaders who are advancing the rights and protections of the LGBTI community. Whether it be our own staff or LGBT Advisory Council or through the Atlanta Council's inaugural class of LGBTI Forum Policy Fellows, we seek to elevate and spotlight the contributions of the LGBTI community that they have on foreign policy and national security. We recognize the importance of allies to advance policies that not only impact the community, but all communities who are affected by the injustices of societal norms and systems. And so we are so pleased to partner with Glyfa. We're joined today by its president, Jeff Anderson, who will close out today's event. And for those of you who are joining from outside of the US government, Glyfa is a remarkable organization. In full disclosure, I served as a vice president of Glyfa 20 years ago when I was at the State Department. For those of you who are not familiar with Glyfa, it has by many accounts been among the most active and engaged organizations in the federal government on these issues. It succeeded in getting the first same-sex partner benefits for U.S. government personnel in history. And in its early days, it advocated to end restrictions on security clearance for LGBT personnel. And later, it successfully pushed the department to expand benefits for same-sex partners. Now, Glyfa is working to ensure accreditation of same-sex spouses, to clarify policies for transgender employees. It's been an important organization, including LGBT rights and US foreign policy and, de and development policy. The Atlanta Council, our mission is all about US leadership, working alongside friends and allies to solve global challenges. It's in that spirit that we are delighted to host the US Deputy Secretary of State, Steve Began, for this special Pride event. Deputy Secretary Began is a remarkable public servant. He's creative consistent, principled, and results-oriented. And I'm proud to say I've known him and watched his career for many, many years across the legislative and executive branches as well as in the private sector. Prior to being appointed by Secretary Pompeo to be Deputy Secretary in December of 2019, he served, of course, as the U.S. Special Representative for North Korea. Prior to the administration, he was Vice President for Intergovernmental Relations at the Ford Motor Company a third generation employee and a Detroit, Detroit, proud Detroit native. Previously, he was National Security Advisor to Senator Majority Leader Bill Frist, Executive Se Secretary of the National Security Council under Condoleezza Rice. And he served as foreign policy advisors to members of the Senate and the House, including as Chief of Staff of the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee when he played a key role on NATO enlargement. Before turning it over to the Deputy Secretary for his opening remarks, I invite all of you who are here to join the conversation by tweeting at hashtag AC Pride. And if you're joining us on the Zoom platform, you can also submit questions using the Q&A function. And please stay tuned after our discussion with the Deputy Secretary uh, for a panel conversation with Aruj Arshad of Freedom House, Mark Bromley, the Chair of the Council of Global Equality, and U.S. Ambassador to Lithuania, Bob Gilchrist. Before all that, I'm going to turn to you, Mr. Deputy Secretary, over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much. Good, uh, greetings to everyone assembled here today. And uh, let me start by thanking you, Damon, uh, for your warm introduction and also your many, many years of friendship. I am deeply grateful to Atlantic Council and to Glyfa uh, for their efforts to organize this event. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for all of our colleagues who are uh, here today. For nearly 30 years, uh, Glyfa has been instrumental in advancing LGBTI rights for Department of State employees, as well as those in other foreign affairs agencies and at our posts around the world. At the heart of your work is my personal priority, advancing American values of equal treatment of every person with respect, dignity, and equality under the law. It's because of this that I welcome the opportunity to join you all here today for uh, an engaged discussion on advanced, advancing human rights for LGBTI persons. I had a great pleasure of serving on the board of directors of Freedom House many years ago when we first began to make this a priority uh, for the human rights community. And it's my pleasure to continue these efforts here at, in the United, United States government, working to protect the rights that are at the heart of our American foreign policy. In this regard, the United States proudly advances our efforts around the globe to protect LGBTI populations from violence, 
criminalization, discrimination, and stigma. As Secretary Pompeo has said, LGBTI persons must be free to enjoy their human rights, their full human rights and fundamental freedoms. In support of the LGBTI community, President Trump has pledged to help end criminalization around the world. The department has established an LGBTI decriminalization working group led by our Human Rights Bureau, DRL, to formulate a decriminalization strategy for each country. The strategy supports local efforts to repeal legal provisions that criminalize LGBTI status or conduct in the roughly 70 countries that currently maintain such laws. This strategy is a key element in our broader LGBTI human rights policy. In March, we issued our annual human rights reports, which spotlighted the stark reality that human rights abuses against LGBTI persons remain commonplace in many countries around the world. But we are holding governments accountable. While there remains much to be done, we are seeing some signs of progress, including in countries like Botswana, Angola, and Gabon. We also recognize that the COVID-19 pandemic has had an outsized impact on marginalized communities around the world, and we're working to make current LGBTI programs flexible and responsive to the impact that the epidemic is having on individuals in our community. Our programs are providing resources for emergency assistance, capacity building, security training, and legal assistance through the Global Equality Fund. And it's not just abroad where we focus on these issues. We need to be lead by example here at home. At the State Department, our management team led by Undersecretary for Management, Brian Bulatow, and our Director General, Carol Perez, are working hard to recruit, retain, and promote from the most diverse possible workforce and to build a culture of inclusion as we do so. We continue to identify ways our workplace can be more inclusive for our LGBTI employees, as well as all of our employees. One area of focus is affording our LGBTI personnel and their families full diplomatic privileges and immunities. Similarly, we are exploring policies that will better address the needs of our transgender colleagues. The world has come a long way in furthering human rights of the LGBTI community. Our society has come a long way and many of us individually have come a long way as well. But there's still much work to be done and we are here to do it together with you. I wanna once again, thank Jeff and, and, and Glippa for the leadership they've shown to thank Damon and the efforts of the Atlantic Council in hosting this event. I look forward to continuing our cooperation together to promote a world where every person is treated equally with respect, dignity, and equality under the law. Thank you very much, Damon, and I'd love to answer uh, any questions if you have some. Thank you so much, uh, I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you for that unambiguous uh, message, not only to your workforce, but to a broader uh, American and, and global audience. If I can ask you, I work at the Atlantic Council, which is obviously interested in foreign affairs, foreign policy. You're at a Deputy Secretary of the State Department. Yet in the wake of, uh, of all the protests we've seen in our country, we've had our own conversation about the underpinnings of U.S. foreign policy. And you, you mentioned yourself that we've got to leave here at home. Council, we're grappling with how renewal at home and the state of American democracy impacts America's role in the world. As Deputy Secretary, how do you think about the connection between what's domestic and foreign? How do the values and principles behind American democracy, American way of life, how do they relate to and underpin American foreign policy? Yeah. So um, moments like this are incredibly challenging for democracies like our own. Uh, many of our uh, many of our warts are on full display for the world to see, and that that is a function of our democracy. That's what makes us the great country we are, that we have, we have uh, the ability, the, our citizens have the ability to bring into, uh, into clear focus the challenges that, that our society uh, continues to grapple with. Our media has, uh, has uh, the full opportunity to publicize that broadly, not only to the American people and around the world. And it feels, you know, it feels at, at, a, at a moment of a challenge like this, almost uh, like a vulnerability, but the, the reality is that you have to go for the whole picture. So now what we do is uh, having honestly confronted some of the challenges that we face in our society, we then go to repair or to improve or to move beyond uh, to address those challenges to the benefit of all of our people. This is the great renewal of the American spirit that we have seen over and over again throughout our country's history. We don't claim perfection. 
We claim that our efforts are aimed at perfecting ourselves. That's a humble but necessary judgment that we have to make in order to advance the strong and full picture of what democratic government offers our people. If the story just ended with, uh, with horrible events like the killing of George Floyd, if that was the end of the story, then we would all be worse off for it. But we will see a process play out where our people demand better and where uh, those who are demanding equality and equal equality of opportunity and treatment, um, we will work together in a democracy to make progress in those areas. I'm confident that there's no greater statement of the value of democracy. And it doesn't just go for racial issues. We've, we've worked as society uh, uh, as, as a leader in the world in, oftentimes, despite uh, great challenges uh, here at home uh, to produce that same equality for LGBTI citizens. Um, this is the rights of the individual. This is what democracy provides. And, and, and I think if we, can, if we can complete the story, that it makes democracy stronger and it makes the model of democracy stronger in the world. Thank you. I think I um, uh, really appreciate that answer. And I'm going to, uh, we're taking a few Q and A's that are coming in on the Zoom platform. Um, we have a comment here in from uh, David Kramer. Uh, wants to send a big thanks, best wishes to a longtime dear friend. Thanks for what you're doing. David passes on asking a hard question, sir, but I'm going to give it from that. Uh, into his area of expertise on, on Russian foreign policy, where we have seen the weaponization, if you will, of LGBT rights uh, in Russia, sometimes the Eurasian way, whether it's in Georgia or Ukraine, promoting that countries moving towards the West, moving towards the European Union, uh, really it, all, it was all about the advancement of, of LGBT rights. Um, how do you think as a foreign policy issue, when you see LGBT quality used as a foreign policy tool, a foreign policy weapon uh, by our adversaries in, in cases like we see in Eurasia today? Yeah, well, I will say uh, maybe too flippantly that uh, we, can, we can thank Vladimir Putin in one respect as he can tell us what's the right side of history by the position that he takes in juxtaposition to ours. Um, uh, we should take that as affirmation that we're on the right path and, and uh, in any of us who follow and work on Russian issues day to day I uh, know very much that, uh, that this is just one element of a uh, overall authoritarian uh, and increasingly repressive society in Russia and one that, that we should push back on on all fronts. Let me, uh, let me just uh, uh, say thank you to, to my uh, dear old friend, uh, uh, David, dear friend, David Kramer, not so old, uh, and, uh, and thank him for those kind words. David and I walked down uh, this path uh, together on Russia and on LGBTI rights. Um, he's... Um, He's been a great uh, role model for international affairs uh, in, in, his, in his integrity on Russia. And he has, he has done so with leadership over, uh, over many, many years. And I thank him for his great work. Um, you talked a little bit about in US foreign policy, how to equate um, some of our values to uh, the commitment to stand up to violence, uh, criminalization, stigma for LGBTI communities. How do you, work this into a foreign policy equation where there are a lot of things in play when you're dealing with countries. Uh, I think you mentioned uh, 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 over 70 countries that still have uh, criminalization of homosexuality on the books. Um, how do you take this forward in, uh, in a portfolio where you've got a lot of issues on the plate with countries? How do you build this into your foreign policy engagement with countries that are whose records uh, lag behind? So I, I, I'd say that it's no different than so many other challenging issues we have with countries and societies around the world. And it's always a complex balancing act between our interests and our values. And, and, and the goal is not to compromise either. Um, I would say that uh, just as, as I commented a moment ago, uh, Damon, that in societies like Russia, for example, moving towards a, a, a more liberal governing structure uh, uh, is uh, oftentimes a core part of the solution to moving towards more equitable treatment for all citizens in that society. And so it's not divisible. Uh, in fact, the same fundamental uh, uh, demands that we have, that the world has actually, because these aren't American ideals, these are global ideals enshrined in international agreements for uh, respect for the human rights of all citizens. Um, this, is, this, is, this is not divisible from America's uh, foreign policy. Uh, you know this uh, from our work together over many years, in particular 
on sustaining the uh, the uh, unity of the transatlantic alliance that it's not simply about interests it's not simply about values it's about uh, a marriage of the two and and uh, and i think uh, these issues fit very much into into the other broad suite of foreign policy and human rights concerns that that the united states has uh, consistently sought to advocate over many decades I'm going to um, bring back a question from uh, Ashton Geese, who is uh, 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 the U.S. representative on the Rainbow Railroad and a former Eclipha board member. Uh, and Ashton says that tomorrow the film Welcome to Chechnya uh, premieres on HBO and asks, what is the United States doing to respond to LGBTQ people in danger like this? Um, how does the U.S. consider visas for those that are, are rounded up in this fashion in the future? Yeah. So uh, I, I will confess, I don't know the exact uh, uh, refugee or excuse me, um, asylum status that that we've provided to anybody involved in the terrible uh, 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 actions that we've seen in Chechnya. And as is, uh, is, uh, those of you who follow Russia closely know, our reach into into Kadyrov's realm is is relatively limited, even with our uh, with our diplomatic presence in Russia. But we've been vocal in, in uh, our criticism and, and pushing back against the depredations against the gay community in, in Chechnya. It's absolutely unacceptable and, it, and I'm looking forward to seeing the movie. Um, although I'm sure it's gonna be a very trying and, and painful movie that the, the, the mistreatment and, and, the, uh, and the killing of, of, of uh, LGBTI people in Chechnya is, a, is an evil that the world should not tolerate in the United States as long as, as, long as I'm here in US foreign policy institution will be a, a vocal critic of, of actions like that. Steve, let me close with just a, a final question about, you said the, the work that you're doing, your own workforce uh, to create a, a diverse State Department. Um, where do you see sort of the, the most important priorities there? Uh, I know uh, Glyph has been working on getting accreditation for same-sex representatives when they are posted overseas. Uh, I know also, and I think you referred to working on policies that relate to transgender employees at State Department. What is in the bundle of issues that you see as a priority for a more diverse, inclusive workforce at the department? So um, uh, we have to not only uh, uh, create equal treatment, but we have to create equality of opportunity. I recently was speaking with a young foreign service officer who, uh, with his husband, is, is, feels limited in the posts that, that he can serve in worldwide. I was just stunned that 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 would is a consideration, but I know it is because um, uh, because of my work uh, in the, the work of my team in looking at um, at how many countries actually maintain laws uh, that that criminalize and even worse uh, 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 punish uh, quite severely the LGBTI uh, uh, life. And I thought that I, th I just never even thought about it in terms of somebody making career searches. I'm 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 of a view that we should. We should be quite insistent that uh, countries protect our diplomats. Accreditation gives them certain rights uh, in that respect, and, and also um, also uh, the immunities that they bring with them as far as diplomats go. But we need to be a role model. Um, it takes a lot of courage, uh, I know, for our individual foreign service officers to serve in some of those posts and in uh, in societies that uh, that are at a minimum are less tolerant and possibly even have created laws against their against their life. Um, but um, but we need to work at that, and I, I, uh, I was sobered by that uh, by that example, and it, it just it's one of many that I've had in just the recent weeks of really having an opportunity uh, because of some of the challenges that our society is facing today to to take pause and see things through the eyes of someone who doesn't have the same uh, opportunities and upbringing as myself. So we're committed. Secretary sent out a, a warm message today uh, in his in his uh, monthly email about Pride Month. Um, the, the department uh, is, is, uh, is there with all of our officers and all of our representatives. And certainly as the uh, chief of mission, we will, uh, we will carry that mission forward also representing uh, the interests of all the foreign affairs community uh, worldwide. And, uh, and that's something I think that, that uh, with, with concerted effort, we can begin to change. Mr. Deputy Secretary, thank you so much. Thank you for kicking off this uh, this virtual pride celebration with state uh, and the Atlanta Council this year. Really appreciate your time. I uh, appreciate, appreciate your unambiguous words here as well. So thank you for being with us. Thanks, Damon. Uh, my best to you and your family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Terrific. We're going to pick up and continue the conversation. I want to really thank the Deputy Secretary for these words. I know we've got more questions that came in, but I want to turn to 
our colleagues that have joined us to continue the conversation. Um, we're going to be joined by Arud Arshad, the Senior Program Manager of Dignity for All at Freedom House, Mark Bromley, the Chair of the Council for Global Equality, and the U.S. Ambassador to Lithuania, Robert Bob Gilchrist. Um, thanks for all of you joining to us. We want to hear your reactions to this, but also get your thoughts on how the United States uh, can be engaging, advancing LGBTI issues as port, part of a foreign affairs, foreign policy portfolio. Um, I'd like to turn to Ambassador Gilchrist, Bob, if I could first. I think you're joining us live in Vilnius. Um, he's our current U.S. Ambassador to Lithuania. He's been active in GLIFA. Um, and just ask how these issues have become part of your personal diplomacy and outreach. How do you uh, tackle and reach out at potentially skeptical audiences, even hostile audiences, are being while still being respectful to the culture, your hosts, and the environment you work in? Um, well, first of all, um, Damon, I'd like to thank you for giving a shout out to Glyfa. Um, as you know, I was president of it a couple of times at that organization. And um, for me, I have a tremendous amount of respect and admiration for Glyfa. And um, I think it's an organization that many people don't know much about, but that's had a, a tremendous amount of influence. Um, as an openly gay ambassador, um, I think what, I, what I've learned in my, I guess, five months here so far is that I have to um, be who I am. And I speak openly about my sexual orientation. I have spoken openly about my activism and what I've done. I've met with organizations, um, but at the same time, I think I've demonstrated really firmly that, that my goal is to be um, a strong and effective U.S. ambassador who's advocating for American interests, but also working in a way that benefits um, Lithuania as an ally as well. So I think um, it's simply, at least for me, not to compromise on my values or who I am um, and to, to look at ways that I can perhaps be a, a, a role model for others. Um, to demonstrate to um, to those who may have homophobic ideas that a that an American ambassador can be quite effective, can be gay, and can be a good guy. And um, I think that that's what I've looked to to embody here during my time so far, and it's what I'm planning to do um, for the rest of my tenure in Lithuania. Thank you, thank you, Bob. I'm going to um, come back to all of you as part of this, but let me turn to Aruj. Um, <clears throat> Arush, I think that um, the program you're running, Dignity for All, is actually a program that enjoys the support of the U.S. government. Um, and perhaps you can say a, a little bit of work about, a little bit word about this program and how uh, this factors into uh, U.S. foreign policy as we've been discussing it. Great. Thank you so much, Damon. And it's really great to be here on this panel. Um, so Dignity for All is a mechanism that is um, funded through the Global Equality Fund, which uh, US government um, is also part of. And um, it's, a, it's a mechanism that provides assistance to LGBTI rights defenders and society organizations globally um, when they're created for the work that they do, they do. And as folks have mentioned earlier, there is a lot of uh, violence and stigma and discrimination and criminalization that affects these communities. So our mechanism supports um, those communities in three different ways. One of them is through the uh, emergency funding. So we're able to quickly mobilize resources and um, support um, human rights and civil society organizations, whether they need legal assistance or medical or well-being and just kind of different ways that we're able to serve uh, we're also able to uh, move some rapid response and um, they could be for an opportunity or a threat that's emerged that was not, um, that we weren't aware of and it's an opportunity for us to quickly move that money and lastly through security trainings because our communities are very vulnerable and it's really important um, to be able for, for them to have the resources they need and especially, you know, right now with COVID, um, there is so much vulnerability in communities right now. So our program supports all of those ways, um, and the LGBTI human rights defenders and CSOs. Perfect. And Arush, I'm gonna pick up with Mark and bring all three of you into this conversation. Um, Mark, you follow this, uh, this set of policy issues over time more closely than, than anyone I really know. And we've talked about some of the things the US is doing, how this factors into policy today. Um, but what more do you think 
we should be, you could be seen from the U.S. government today uh, in promoting equality. Well, first of all, thanks, Damon. Thanks to Atlantic Council and the Glyfa for this conversation. Um, look at uh, uh, the Deputy Secretary mentioned uh, President Trump's call for decriminalization at the UN General Assembly last year. Um, that really builds on a policy that was initiated back in 2011 by President Obama to um, uh, where he issued a presidential memorandum calling for all foreign affairs agencies to leverage diplomacy and investments to promote decriminalization. And since 2011, the State Department and our embassies, USAID, have been using our investments, have been investing in civil society with the Global Equality Fund through the programs that Arouge mentioned. Um, we've been working with our international law enforcement academies on, on hate crimes laws and, and rule of law issues as they relate to criminalization. Um, and, and there's been some really spectacular diplomacy through our embassies on these issues. Um, I'd note in particular, uh, US Ambassador Foote, who in Zambia in December, really went out very publicly to uh, denounce uh, the prosecution of two individuals, uh, a same-sex couple, who were sentenced to 15 years in prison under the country's sodomy law, and was essentially kicked out of Zambia for his outspoken um, concern over that human rights abuse. Um, so there have been uh, some, some really important investments in diplomacy and, and funding uh, around decriminalization and uh, um, violence abatement. Um, but I think we are concerned that increasingly um, in this administration, we see the administration acting unilaterally. So there was recently a statement um, from the core group of countries at the UN that uh, addressed uh, human rights concerns in the context of COVID and particularly human rights concerns for LGBTI individuals in the context of COVID. And the US chose not to join that statement, but to put out its own statement. Um, similarly, the, the Equal Rights Coalition, which is a coalition of 42 like-minded governments, and the U.S. has been a strong supporter and a founding member of that coalition. They also put recently uh, put out recently a statement about uh, human rights for LGBTI individuals in the context of COVID, recognizing that LGBTI communities um, are uniquely vulnerable to COVID because of their overall marginalization in, in all countries, including our own, um, but also that many governments, unfortunately, are using this public health emergency to roll back rights. Uh, in in uh, Hungary, for example, the government has used this pandemic as uh, an opportunity to take away transgender recognition from individuals in Hungary. Um, we've seen uh, Uganda use public health excuses uh, to round up LGBTI youth and put them in prison uh, without trial or, or access to lawyers for several months. Um, so, you know, we are at a, at this point where, where you know, I think uh, ambassadors like Ambassador Gilchrist continue to engage robustly, where we are investing through the Global Equality Fund. But I'm just concerned that too often we are going it alone and not joining our colleagues at the UN, not joining our colleagues in the Equal Rights Coalition to act multilaterally, to act together with our with our colleagues and our like-minded countries on these issues and and these these issues and particularly the issue of decriminalization is not an issue where you can go at it alone right we need to address this together with with our allies if we're really going to have an impact and mark let me continue on that we had a question that ryan kaminsky submitted it was for uh, steve uh, the deputy secretary um, about the decriminalization process um, He's asking, uh, is, you know, what, how is this set up in state in terms of uh, the, the process and what's publicly available, but specifically, is there an avenue for civil society to provide input into these work streams? And as someone who's, who's part of this conversation, uh, have you had the opportunity, do you, do you know about uh, how civil society can feed into any strategy on decriminalization? No, we, we have been, uh, we've been waiting, frankly, for almost a year for a strategy to come out of uh, the Human Rights Bureau. You know, I appreciate the Deputy Secretary recognized that 
that every country is unique and every country requires its own decriminalization strategy, but still we're waiting for an overall framework that looks at how do you balance carrots and sticks? How do you balance investments in local civil society, rule of law programming? Um, how do we leverage our diplomacy in a smart way with like-minded embassies in any given country? And, and you know, those pillars have been there since 2011 with, with President Obama's memorandum, and they certainly can be refined and adjusted, but we are waiting for that overall framework from the Human Rights Bureau. Um, and then, you know, certainly would offer our assistance and, and, and the assistance of, of, of many of the groups who are tuning into this discussion to help fine tune that strategy in any given country. And I appreciate that some of that has to be quiet diplomacy. Um, not every ambassador can speak up as publicly as Ambassador Foote did in Zambia, nor would it be wise in every case for that to happen. But, but I think there does need to be a, a more formal opportunity for civil society input, because at the end of the day, decriminalization in particular, but really engagement across the spectrum on LGBTI issues needs to be gu guided by local actors who are invested and have most to gain and most at risk in, in these contexts. Thanks, Mark. Um, uh, let me turn to Aruj. Mark made a reference, uh, as well as uh, the Deputy Secretary, to the impact of COVID on LGBTI communities. You've done some research and work on this, Aruj. Um, why, why do uh, we need to be thinking about the particular impact of this pandemic uh, on LGBTI communities globally? Um, how is this a relevant factor in, in uh, the strategy today? Yeah, I mean, um, ever since COVID um, became uh, something to be reckoned with, um, so many of our consortium partners, um, Dignity is made up of eight organizations, and so many of our consortium partners have been tracking the impact, um, and it's it's really devastating. I mean, the first some of the first news that we started hearing were about food deprivation, which has continued to be the major issue in this pandemic because so many of the communities that are part of the LGBTI community are um, working in informal economies and gig economies um, and their, their livelihood has completely gone. And um, uh, communities that are already vulnerable have become increasingly vulnerable because of that. So people have had to stay at, at you know, homes where they're experiencing homophobia and transphobia. Um, we've certainly funded um, cases to help uh, human rights defenders relocate from those really dangerous situations. Um, we're seeing governments that Mark has mentioned uh, really weaponize um, COVID um, and to really target LGBTI communities. And um, that, you know, seeing the impact long term is really what we're now reckoning with is where is the civil society uh, post COVID? What's going to happen to LGBTI communities when you don't have food, you don't have basic needs that are being met right now. And a lot of organizations are really focused on surviving. Um, people are focused on surviving. Um, we have religious leaders that have come out and condemned LGBTI communities and blamed COVID on them. Um, so we're really seeing a rise of both state and um, conservative social cultural um, factors that are uh, impacting the the way that COVID is really differentially impacting LGBTI communities. And at the end of the day, you know, when we look at the landscape with um, 70 plus countries criminalizing LGBTI communities, um, it's no surprise because our communities have already been criminalized and are affected. And so when you add COVID on top of it, um, you know, even accessing relief services. So um, Victor, Victor Madrigal, who is the UN expert on SOGI, uh, talks about how if you cannot separate access to relief from um, the fact that people are being criminalized. So people are not accessing services that are provided by the government if they're, for example, being distributed by the police. Like that's not something that can really uh, work. Um, so we're seeing communities being hit on all sides. And um, and then of course, the long-term economic impact in terms of donor governments and uh, funders who are um, take, you know, positioning away from funding LGBTI communities because they're redirecting resources. Um, and so, you know, even in terms of long term, we're really reckoning with what that would look like. So those are some of the ways that um, COVID has impacted LGBTI communities. Thanks for that, Rouge. I'm going to turn to Ambassador Gilchrist, Bob, for two questions that strike me as questions for our chief of mission. 
I've got a couple of colleagues on the line who are going to ask some questions as well, but others who are still with us, um, keep submitting your questions on the Zoom platform in the Q&A function or uh, Twitter or Facebook at hashtag AC Pride. Um, but Bob, uh, Ambassador Dick Hoagland has asked a question saying, in my experience, some State Department authors, officers believe that they really do need to remain closeted if they're going to rise to the highest ranks in the service. Um, what words would you have for them? Let's see, do we have you, Bob and Vilnius, Ambassador Gilchrist? No, I think it's definitely changed. Um, so I think um, internally within the Foreign Service, um, you know, I, I, I think we, we've advanced in many ways. Um, we haven't had a lesbian ambassador yet or a, um, or a LGBTI person of color as ambassador yet. Um, so there's still progress to be made. But I think um, within the institution, um, it's much less of an issue than it certainly was when I began the Foreign Service um, 30 years ago. Um, and a lot of this transformation has happened um, um, because of Wifa. So I, I think that that statement these days is no longer one that's um, valid like it used to be. So let me ask as well, thanks Bob for that. I appreciate um, the personal angle. Um, as a chief of mission, you oversee uh, team members that come from across the federal government workforce and not just the US State Department uh, uh, can have up to 20 plus different federal agencies present. And so one of the attendees is asking, um, can there be better training or maybe what kind of training there is on unconscious bias, EEO awareness and other matters um, we see overseas uh, these challenges, um, whether it's legislation, police actions, but also uh, uh, discrimination on race, ethnicity, religion, other, other Title VII uh, bases. And, um, what kind of training do people coming overseas to represent the United States work, work like? Could there be a more structured way for anybody representing the United States as a, as a federal employee at a mission overseas, uh, go through a respect and inclusion process training for them all there? I mean, I think that there's um, definitely more to be done. And certainly the events of the past month have, have um, caused lots of um, thinking within the, the, the State Department and the Foreign Service and lots of introspection. And um, so, yes, there can be a lot of progress. There's a, a really good um, training course that the Deputy Secretary actually um, recommended about a month ago um, to all staff on unconscious bias. And so, at least within my mission, I've asked that all staff actually take this. And I think um, I think it's something that we all need to be ma made more aware of, not just not just the US government staff, but also um, our local hires um, who, who come with um, different attitudes as well. But I think it's a work in progress. I think as a leader, you always have to model um, those values that you believe the rest of the mission should follow. And um, so I think that that's a key element of what we have to do. Um, I do think that there's more that the State Department can do. And a lot has, has come out over the past few weeks on that, um, including in various national publications. And I think it's led to a period of introspection and I'm hopeful that it'll lead to, um, to improvements in the Foreign Service. Um, certainly not just on LGBTI, but in terms of, um, of how we, we better incorporate and integrate um, and include all minorities. Thank you. And uh, Carl Olson is also uh, giving a shout out to that unconscious bias uh, class at FSI as well. Um, Taylor Westfall, uh, Westfall has joined us. I believe she's here live from uh, the Inspector General's office and has a question as well. Can I turn to you, Taylor? Yes, thank you so much, Damon. Um, actually piggybacking kind of on that theme, within the LGBT community, broadly, there's a, a variety of opinions and schools of thought about how to further our own rights um, I was hoping that maybe Aruj and Mark can speak to how do we acknowledge those opinions while also really addressing the internal racism and sexism that's very much alive within the LGBT community. Thank you. I'll go. I'll, I'll um, go okay. first. Um, yeah, no, that that's a really good question, especially right now in this moment. And um, I think for for me personally, as a queer woman of color. Um, this is something that I have reckoned with my entire life. Um, and I think that it's important uh, to be able to, to acknowledge the history, um, to acknowledge the disparities within the movements um, that we're part of and um, 
to really work with uh, bridge builders that are part of um, communities that are able to bridge some of the, the ways that the uh, there might be a dissonance around a conversation. And, um, and you know, I've talked to folks who, are, who who say, you know, we need an inside and outside strategy as well. And so figuring out where it is that we're able to move systems um, internally, where where is it that we, we, we can um, uh, have the diversity inclusion equity task force moving huge systems with, you know, and that's going to take a long time, but we also need pressure from outside. And so, um, I think acknowledging what ha the history and um, such a there is such a long history uh, around racial injustice and um, and how do we how do we move forward with uh, with a strategy that is inclusive, uh, which I think other folks have also mentioned. So th those would be my initial kind of um, sort of what I and I've been thinking about this a lot too. Yeah. In, in the last thank month. you. Yeah. Question. Thank you, Ruz. You want to pick that up, Mark, and then uh, we'll turn to Ruz. Uh, sure. Thank you. I, I, the only thing I would add to that is, you know, as Ruz suggests, inclusion doesn't happen by itself, right? It it, it requires thought and purpose. Um, and I know in the context, for example, of the Equal Rights Coalition, which again is this coalition of 42 like-minded governments, there's only one country from Africa. There are a number of leaders from Latin America but only one country from Africa and no countries from Asia Pacific. Um, and I know it's a, a goal of the co-chairs of the ERC, which right now are the United Kingdom and Argentina, to really build that diversity. And, and, and they have a plan to reach out and build that diversity. And I think all of us need to support them in that diversity building because we do need, we do need a diversity of voices in these spaces. Similarly, we're trying to bring in more civil society organizations uh, from around the world. So it's not just the well-resourced Global North LGBTI organizations that have the luxury of employing full-time staff that can participate in these meetings, but that it really um, includes groups from all over the world and particularly the Global South who are operating on a shoestring often as volunteers, but their voices are just so crucial because uh, without them, this can't be an equitable, diverse movement. Perfect, thank you. We also, I think, have a question from Shalom uh, Constantino from uh, the State Department's Public Affairs team. Shalom, are you on? Yes, I am. Uh, first of all, happy Pride, everyone. We forgot it's Pride, right? Um, my question is more about global affairs. I'm taking us back to foreign policy. Uh, recently, there have been calls to withhold aid from countries that criminalize homosexuality. Uh, I wanted to ask about your take um, in regards to how the U.S. can engage uh, such countries. Thank you for reminding us. Happy Pride, Shalom. Who are you directing that to? Anyone in particular? Since it's uh, foreign policy, I'd go with uh, Mark uh, and Ambassador Gilchrist, please. Uh, please. Uh, sure, I'm happy to start. Uh, happy Pride, thanks, Shalom. Um, so in terms of aid conditionality, that's often discussed around decriminalization in particular. Um, and in general, we, uh, we do not support the call for, glo for global aid conditionality because it's very unusual that local LGBTI groups are actually calling for conditionality, right? Because the risk that they would be blamed or scapegoated for a reduction in, you know, for an increase in maternal mortality in a country because, because of what they're calling for, the, the risks are just too great in terms of, of playing with aid flows uh, in most cases. But we do very much support the idea that we need smart investments in any given country. And that means that in certain countries, particularly in the 70 or so countries that criminalize consensual relationships, there are certain investments that are just not going to make sense. There are certain public health investments, uh, particularly through PEPFAR, that will not be possible. Um, there are certain investments that may need to be restructured so that they don't go through the Ministry of Health, but go through the NGO sector. We very much support the, the careful consideration of how we invest in any country, particularly in a criminalizing country, to minimize the impact on the LGBTI community, to maximize the opportunity 
to to uh, reconsider those laws and and decriminalize. But it's very rare that you find local actors whose lives are on the line that are actually asking for conditionality. Um, so we 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 support smart investments, but not conditionality as a general rule. Um, and I'll add that, um, I mean, cutting off assistance also often means cutting off um, support for those sectors, those organizations that actually are advancing change. Um, and I mean, a lot of our development assistance revolves around justice reform, um, combating gender violence, um, um, infant mortality, um, I mean, there, there, there are a large number of, of objectives of foreign assistance that in many ways um, support those sectors that are, that are most critical for reform. Um, so I think you can't look at it in, in black and white terms, but certainly ensuring that, um, that LGBTI human rights issues um, are incorporated more, more, more fully in, in our foreign policy and, and more in the conversations that we're having um, with, um, with other governments and in our programming. I think that there's more that we can do on that. Um, but I think cutting off assistance um, oftentimes uh, achieves exactly the opposite result that, that you want. Thank you. Um, let me pick up a few more questions here. Uh, Daniel Bookman has a really <clears throat> interesting question. This, as Western diplomats, our presence as out LGBT Americans sometimes reinforces a harmful narrative that queerness is a Western export. So how do any of you as panelists recommend foreign policy practitioners navigate this perception in working towards progress for the, commu the community, but in conservative countries? Is there a situation in which staying closeted may be appropriate? Um, and maybe Aruj, uh, maybe you start with this. We talked a little bit about even a principle of, of do no harm. How do, how do you sort of balance these? And then I'll come back to you, uh, Bob. Yeah, um, the principle, principle of do no harm is, so integral, integral to the work that we do. And um, I think a lot about um, Pakistan, for example, um, which is a country where I'm from and um, also uh, was privileged to do some um, work there and um, with LGBTI communities. And it is absolutely the country where this principle of do no harm is so important because um, LGBTI issues First of all, they're not a monolithic, right? So in a country like Pakistan, um, for example, there was a really progressive transgender law that passed in 2018. And that passed because there was a lot of indigenous activism from specifically from Khwaja Sara communities, which are uh, sort of trans communities in Pakistan, but kind of very specific to South Asia. Um, and um, they used sort of a, a way, a historical precedent and even working with the Council for Islamic Ideology to pass a very progressive law and a law that is not just for, for South Asia, but globally uh, can be used as an example. And so I think that a lot of times people are really surprised by that. Um, um, but it's, it's so I think it's important to really look at um, what is sort of the, the especially the pre-colonial history, because I think um, that has a huge impact. Like we have to, you know, going back to Taylor's question also, like we have to acknowledge the history of, uh, for example, colonialism that has really impacted a lot of countries that um, uh, we work in and that you have to really have that careful balance. So in Pakistan, for example, it would make sense to do more uh, kind of uh, if, if there's a Western involvement, because that did came up during the passage of the law. And it was very important to, to make sure that it was uh, seen as sort of a indigenous uh, work, that that work happens in the background and that the, there's support for it, but that it's not sort of front and center. Um, so I think that is uh, that is absolutely really important um, in many parts of the world. Bob, do you want to add to that? How to avoid the perception of, of queerness as being a Western export? I mean, I think as, as diplomats, we always have to be strategic in terms of advancing what our interests are. And our interests include um, um, advancing LGBTI rights and, and equality um, and certainly combating um, anti-sodomy laws. Um, so I'm a, I'm a strong advocate for being strategic. Um, at the same time, I think that American diplomats can, can model um, by being openly gay um, and demonstrating that you can be perfectly effective um, and good um, and be gay at the same time and have an impact in that way. Um, so I, I imagine, I'm sure that, in fact, I know that there's circumstances where, where embassies have to take a more um, nuanced approach 
um, to helping um, LGBTI groups and other other um, other organizations in particular countries. Um, I tend to err on the side of being forward leaning, um, and I certainly hope that that. Um, the belief that we in some ways have to take a back seat in socially conservative countries doesn't lead um, our diplomats and others to being um, unnecessarily closeted or, or reticent to, to push forward on a particular policy because they're afraid of the response. So that's what I've got. Let me, um, let me ask a, a wrap up question that uh, I'll start with Mark. Each, each of you feel free to reply if you'd like before I turn to Jeff Anderson. Um, it's from Elise Goss Alexander, and she says, okay, if you could dream big, what shift would you want to see in U.S. policy going forward towards LGBT rights? Uh, so thinking about um, not what's possible today, but what you would want to see uh, if you could go big uh, in terms of how this fits into U.S. foreign policy. Mark? Um, wow, what a great wrap-up question. Okay, I think... Um, the Global Equality Fund uh, that's administered through the State Department, but is a pooled fund that includes U.S. government money, but but other governments also contribute. That has been an, an amazingly effective support mechanism for LGBTI groups and issues around the world, including the emergency fund that Aruj uh, administers. I think that fund could be tripled in size. I know this is a this is a, a, a an era where we have a lot of uh, economic concerns, and and that's not going to be easy. But the amount of money that goes to the LGBTI community is minuscule, minuscule compared to the need, and to compare and compared to our investments, um, even in in other marginalized communities. If you look at uh, the funding that we use to support persecuted religious groups around the world, or persons with disabilities. Uh, or other marginalized communities, all of which I think are incredibly important, but the LGBTI community um, is pennies on the dollar in terms of, of other investments in other communities. So uh, I'm gonna go bold and say at least a tripling of investment. Um, I also think what we really need to grapple with right now is how do we balance um, uh, sincere religious freedom with LGBTI equality? And unfortunately, uh, there are many conservative countries and advocates and lawyers around the world who are trying to use religious liberty uh, as a weapon, who are trying to weaponize religious freedom to deny equality to LGBTI communities. Um, and, and we are strong supporters of religious freedom as a fundamental human right, but the right to equality and dignity is equally valuable. And the, this conversation is happening in a very difficult context in the U.S. right now, and it's also happening on the world stage. And that conversation is interrelated. And I really think our country, the U.S., has to get to a better answer in terms of how we balance those competing interests. And, and, and then we will have a, um, a better leg to stand on with more humility uh, and balance. Uh, as we support LGBTI communities globally. So, so learning how to balance those interests, I think is just going to be incredibly important. Um, and we haven't come up with a good answer yet. Yeah, great point, Mark. Aruj, would you like to uh, take a stab at that as well? If you could see a, a big advance, what, if you could dream big, what change would you want to see in US policy going forward on LGBT rights? And then we'll wrap with Ambassador Gilbert. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely echo Mark's um, comments about funding. Um, the Global Philanthropy Project does um, a great overview and tracks uh, funding uh, for LGBTI issues globally, and it is it is very insignificant um, the the percentage that LGBTI communities are getting as part of the larger pot. Um, the other piece is, um, uh, I'm a big believer of uh, South to South um, dialogue, and so providing those spaces for LGBTI folks in the global south to be able to learn from each other. Um, and, um, and that has already been happening, but just continuing to make those investments um, for communities and to also invest um, in diverse leadership within the LGBTI communities in country, because a lot of times what happens is there are only few people that end up getting recognized, that end up getting you know the travel opportunities, the funding, uh, a lot of times it tends to be uh, cisgender gay men and a lot of the community is left out. And so I would um, 
you know, that would be amazing to be able to support a more diverse leadership in country. Fantastic. Thanks, Aruj. Ambassador Gilchrist. Um, I agree um, um, with um, the two other panelists. Uh, it's resources. Um, I've seen how transformative um, our program programming can be um, with regard to LGBTI rights or with regard to human rights in general. Um, I don't know that the American public fully appreciates um, how much we've been able to help a lot of organizations and groups and how in the end, um, 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 societies that respect LGBTI rights and human rights in general are, are generally more stable societies and that also advances our security interests as well. Um, so I will, I will agree with the two others and, and say really um, resources, uh, resources. Terrific. Thank you, Ambassador Gilchrist, Rouge, and Mark. Thank you for joining us here today. That was a great conversation. Uh, we've learned a lot. Um, we had we got quite a few other questions that popped up. I'll just mention one as I before I hand over to Jeff. Uh, someone had asked, has the State Department reckoned with the past of the lavender scare? What steps to make sure that people feel welcome and safe serv serving in the Foreign Service? I'm just going to close with a personal thank you to Glyfa because I'm sure that the legacy and the scars of the Lavender Scare remain at the institution. And yet I could tell when I came to the State Department a couple decades ago, everyone who preceded me had felt really at risk. Their security clearance is at risk, the, uh, the potential for prosecution. And everyone that was coming in after me was coming into a different mindset and a different world in the State Department. And for me personally, it was the first time I started a job where on day one, I was out as a national security professional, thanks in large part to a Glyfa member who came up to me uh, right away and, uh, and called me out. Uh, but Glyfa gave me a, a place uh, to get involved in the State Department. And so um, there may be still issues in which the State Department has to overcome the scarring of the Lavender Scare. But I know that Glyfa has been a fundamental role in helping to address that. So I'm just so delighted that we could partner with you today on this event, that we could welcome the Deputy Secretary to this platform together for your members who are global as well as a broader public audience. And I also just want to invite everybody who's joined us today uh, to join us tomorrow for Continuation of Pride. Uh, tomorrow at noon Eastern time, we're going to be featuring uh, the out leaders of the world, uh, Prime Minister Xavier Battel of, of Luxembourg, Prime Minister Anna Brnovich of Serbia, and up until this weekend, the Tishik, uh, who is now the deputy, uh, uh, Leo Varadkar of Ireland, to wrap up Pride Month, uh, which should be a, a fantastic conversation with out leaders on the world stage today. And with that, let me hand over to Jeff to close out our program today. Great. Thank you very much, Damon. I just want to give a big thanks to you and to the Atlantic Council for uh, hosting this event and to the Deputy Secretary, uh, Ambassador Gilchrist, to Rouge and Mark for the conversation. I also want to thank the audience, uh, which I was scrolling through the participant list and, and I noticed a lot of Glyfa members included in the audience. Glyfa, we, we now have a network of, of, of roughly a thousand people. And there's a common thread that brings us all together. Well, a couple common threads. Uh, one and the most important is that we're all serving with pride, which is our theme this year. We're serving as pride, as foreign affairs professionals, as diplomats, and also as, as LGBT plus uh, diplomats and foreign affairs professionals. Uh, you heard about some of our priorities this year, accreditation and, 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 and clarifying policies within the department to help our trans uh, colleagues serve with dignity and, and pride. Uh, but we're also working with other groups uh, in the State Department to, to beyond LGBT issues to make the State Department more diverse and more inclusive. Um, serving with pride. We're serving with pride around the world. We have uh, post representatives in about 50 different countries, and they're working with a lot of local organizations. And, and, and oftentimes, uh, work very closely with, with people within the embassy and, and in Washington to support projects from the Global Equality Fund. Uh, they're also working with front offices to help mark pride. Uh, I think over, uh, I think a couple dozen embassies, I was just looking through different pictures this morning, marked pride around the world this year. So thank you for this important conversation. This is, uh, conversations are never an end, but just a, as a, be a beginning or a continuation. So I really appreciate this time and, and look forward to uh, more cooperation. So thanks again, Damon, and everyone who participated.